Thank you to both of you for arranging this uh, and for all of you to come here. Is this visible? Yes. Is that OK? Uh, uh, I, I have, I've sort of munched together three sets of slides. Uh, the first step is uh, an intro to Creative Commons itself. Uh, the second set is about our new set of licenses that came out five months ago, CC4 licenses. <laughs> the third set is what I consider more as a sort of a FAQ, which I developed because of my own lack of understanding about copyright licenses. And then the final set, which has no slides at all, is really about CC science. Uh, at any point where you think that I'm going too slow, you can start yawning and looking at your watches. If you think I'm going too fast, you can ask me to stop. Uh, <clears throat> shall I assume all of you know about Creative Commons? I shouldn't assume that. So we are an international nonprofit based in, in Mountain View. Um, and uh, we work globally through affiliates, uh, such as uh, Darius and Louise. Uh, we have affiliates in, uh, <coughs> uh, we're, we're about 11 years old now. We celebrated our 10th birthday, a big party in uh, December of 2012. Um, uh, I'll actually come with the affiliates in just a second. Uh, let me just tell you, uh, I, this is our vision of the world as we see. Um, uh, vision statements are usually very grandiose. Uh, this one is also grandiose, but I do like it very much. For some reason, it, it is a big motivation for me. Uh, I really love, love its far reach. A vision is nothing less than realizing the full potential of the internet. Uh, and uh, uh, really uh, seeing a world where uh, digital knowledge is, is openly shared. In fact, we recently had a little confab together and in the office we're trying to figure out what we want to see uh, Creative Commons do in the next 10 years. And the over, <coughs> overriding sentiment was encapsulated by three words, open by default. Um, which is what we would like to see, which is what this vision tries to, to, to say. Uh, this is our uh, international affiliates. It's actually not a very up-to-date uh, set of flags here. We've added a few. Uh, so our affiliates are essentially uh, both, how would you describe it, people and, and kind of an organization that is actually uh, in agreement with Creative Commons headquarters to uh, <coughs> to call itself Creative Commons of that region, like Creative Commons Island. Um, and they are the main reach through which Creative Commons spreads its, uh, its work and its ideas. Um, one of the ones missing there is, is India, actually, that was formed, uh, or rather reformed uh, last year uh, in October. Uh, I think there are about 74, 75 affiliates around the world. Um, uh, <clears throat> Creative Commons uh, makes copyright licenses, uh, meaning that it actually is based on the system of copyright law, um, and it lies somewhere in between <clears throat> all rights reserved to copyright on the left and no rights at all, public domain on the very right. Um, <clears throat> here's another uh, spectrum that shows sort of how Creative Commons applies somewhere between all rights reserved and no rights reserved. We have a range of licenses that sort of span the gamut of uh, rights that you can, you can assign to, you can give away to people. Um, <clears throat> these are our building blocks of licenses. Uh, uh, when, uh, actually I'll have more slides uh, later on which will show the progression of our licenses. Um, but essentially, the idea with Creative Commons licenses is that they allow the creator to keep some rights and give away other rights. And in my third set of slides, I will touch back on this uh, in a bit. Uh, I won't go into the details of licenses <clears throat> because that'll just take way too much time. But suffice to say that you can create a work and you can apply a license, and through that you can transfer, you can allow the licensee to have some rights in your work um, and still keep some rights to yourself. Um, <clears throat> our licenses apply some conditions, they give some permissions uh, to the user, and they apply some conditions where, where the user is required to give credit back to the, to the creator of the work. Uh, and there are some fundamental understandings that go, there's no warranty, there's no implied endorsement, 
uh, you have to, you cannot restrict the license of the work in any way, which uh, which restricts the ability of downstream users to reuse the work as the license intended, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, here are our six licenses that we make. Uh, so Creative Commons makes only one thing. It makes copyright licenses. Uh, and sadly, the only thing it makes, it gives away for free. So we have no source of income. Uh, it's a terrible business model to have. <laughs> you know? uh, so we make six uh, licenses. Uh, <clears throat> these are our six licenses. Uh, as you can see, all of the licenses require credit. Uh, uh, and then they impose certain uh, conditions on the user. We actually also make a couple of public domain tools. Um, CC0 is something that I'm very particularly proud of because I was a part of the process that ended up creating CC0, um, which allows you to opt out of the copyright system completely by dedicating your work to the public domain. We have a public domain mark, which is really used for marking works that are already in the public domain with more clarity about their status. Uh, our licenses are... Uh, really a, a, to the human observer, they're, they're a badge, they're a symbol, right? Uh, <clears throat> but underneath that is machine readable code, and which is backed by an actual deed that lawyers can understand and, and fight in the court if, they, if needed. So it's a three-layered license, uh, a, a visible uh, thing, which is basically this. And I have a theory about that. I think it actually is just as important as the, as the legal part. Uh, maybe that's because I'm not a lawyer. Um, uh, and then there's the legal part which gives it the teeth. Uh, my theory actually is that, that, that Creative Commons is not just uh, tweaking the law, it's actually tweaking the culture of sharing. Uh, it's a theory that I've been thinking about for a while. You know, uh, the pens, the t-shirts, they are symbols of a community, and we kind of feel a part of a community, and that's a pretty powerful thing. Especially when I, like, when I attended the global summit to see people from all around the world believing in something. Uh, so it's fundamentally changing the way people view ownership of, of uh, visual content. Um, but um, anyway, this is the this is the uh, composition of our license: uh, a machine readable code, which is written in uh, RDFA. Uh, you can write code and actually parse the license. Uh, which is actually important for some fields that I will discuss when I talk about the science part uh, and the legal code and the and the and the icons. <coughs> uh, we've had uh, several iterations of license, just like software. Our licenses are versioned. Uh, our latest version is uh, oh, it says expected in 2013, but guess what? We actually it did arrive in 2013, um, version four, <coughs> uh, and. Uh, when we started with version one, there were actually a lot of licenses. There were about 11 different licenses, and it's been whittled down to now only six different licenses. Um, version four licenses were created uh, after about two or two and a half years of public consultation. So they're truly a crowdsourced license in many ways uh, from around the world, contributed their ideas and opinions and, and uh, uh, intricacies and idiosyncrasies about their jurisdictions to create the license. Uh, <clears throat> this chart shows a growth in, in Creative Commons licensed works on the internet. This chart is horribly out of date, uh, partly because uh, we really have no good way of measuring how many things out there are licensed in the Creative Commons. <clears throat> uh, this was one study that was done, and they estimated something like uh, 400 million works out there, which is absolutely nonsense because a couple of days ago um, one of my colleagues, Cable Green, uh, sent an email saying that on Flickr itself, just on Flickr, there are 305 million photographs licensed from the Creative Commons. Uh, so my estimate would be that probably there are close to a billion pieces of things that are licensed to the Creative Commons license, way more than 400 million that it says. Uh, and it has really taken off uh, particularly by platform adoption. Flickr is one of those. YouTube is another one. Uh, videos are licensed on, the, on YouTube under Creative Commons. Uh, Vimeo is another video platform. Um, so when platforms uh, you incorporate Creative Commons uh, license chooser, it really creates a massive uptake in, in, in the license. Um, 
this shows a license chooser. I won't go into that. It's a very simple license chooser. You, you, if you want to apply a license, you go to a website, you click, you click on a few buttons, and you get a little bit of code that you can apply to your, life, to your work, and off you go. Um, this is what the code actually looks like. Oh, this is terrible, I'm sorry. Uh, it's basically uh, HTML with a few other tags that can be recognized. Um, there you go, a bit better. Sorry about that. Uh, syntax highlighted um, <clears throat> that you can recognize through uh, by writing a computer software. Um, here are some examples of, of uh, actually uh, some significant users of Creative Commons licenses in music. Uh, Free Music Archive, Jamendo, SoundCloud, these wonderful platforms that you can get all manner of music uh, uh, that is CC licensed. Uh, my favorite is SoundCloud right now at least. Uh, uh, lots of examples in journalism and broadcast. Um, it's actually funny, Internet Archive is mentioned in the music, but Internet Archive is a big, big user of journalism works. And also they archive um, thousands of hours of video news footage, uh, papers, uh, you know, anything they can grab, basically they archive those. Uh, <clears throat> under publishing, we have tons of uh, publishers, both scientific and, and non-scientific. Uh, some of the well-known ones are like Public Library of Science and PAJ, Biomed Central, uh, and of course Wikipedia, which is the fifth, uh, probably the fifth largest uh, most visited site on the internet. Uh, every single thing is licensed under a CC by SA license. Uh, 22 million articles, I think, something like that. So that's a pretty significant user of CC licenses. Um, museums and archives, big users there. <coughs> Europeana, uh, all the metadata under uh, that Europeana releases under a CC0 public domain, actually. Uh, Figshare, Data Triad, and Harvard Libraries. Uh, are big users. Uh, the CERN library uh, adopted uh, public the CC0 dedication. Um, so that was a that was a very quick intro to Creative Commons itself. Uh, please ask me any questions if you have if you, if you need uh, any further information. But I'll move on to our CC4 licenses. These licenses, uh, this version of license came out in November, uh, as I mentioned. It took about two and a half to three years of development. Um, just like any software, it was delayed many, many times before it was finally released, much to our relief. Uh, the main thing from the point of view of science that is very uh, important about CC4 licenses is that they are finally appropriate for scientific data for data sets. Um, I think I explained that more in a bit, so I won't, I won't jump ahead there. Um, <clears throat> like all other CC licenses, CC version 4 also says that if you use my work that is CC licensed, that doesn't mean that I'm endorsing your work, so there's no endorsement uh, that is implied. Uh, the licenses are made easier by way of allowing the user to give attribution to the uh, person who created the work. Uh, this is particularly important when you're using work that has been, that has gone through many iterations with many users, uh, and you need to give attribution to a lot of people. Uh, there's, a, there's a language there that says that you can give attribution by any, <coughs> by any means reasonable to means and medium or something like that. Uh, so basically, what it means is that if you have a if you have a ton of people that you would have to otherwise give credit to, you can create a web link to a page where you can list those people, and you don't have to link it, give it with your work itself. Um, this is the most important part to me <coughs> as a scientist. Uh, uh, the database rights, which are very particular to Europe uh, and a few other countries were not covered by CC licenses until version 4, uh, which meant that if you saw a work that was licensed under CC you, that came out of Europe, you didn't know whether the database rights underneath in that work were also licensed or not. With version 4 now, uh, database rights can also be licensed. What it essentially means is <coughs> that the user doesn't have to worry about potentially violating database rights. Um, and uh, this really makes it 
very frictionless uh, for both the users and the, and the creators of the database. Um, There's some language about clarity of third party rights. I won't go into that. Uh, there's a cure clause which basically says, now this is a new one, which basically says that if you violate any of the terms in the license, then the license would ordinarily terminate immediately. But now I, as the creator of the work, can give you a notice and you have 30 days to, to correct the breach that you committed. And if you do, then the license reinstates itself. Uh, it's sort of modeled after, after GPL's cure clause. Uh, you can add warranty. So, so as I said, you know, no endorsement is implied, but but users can add warranty and add value to their work uh, if they, and the licensors can if they want to. Uh, customizable di disclaimers. Okay. That is about CC4 licenses. I'm actually going to jump into something that when I. So I'm not a lawyer, and I'm here in the faculty of law. What am I doing here? Uh, when I started <coughs> working with Creative Commons, uh, initially as a volunteer about six, seven years ago, uh, it was a tough time dealing with law. Everything that made sense to me made no sense to the lawyers. And everything that lawyers said made no sense to me. That was like a fundamental disconnect. Uh, and I've come to. I've been able to bridge that gap now, but it's been a struggle. And I can only understand what other scientists must feel. And I hope to be that bridge in between the scientists and the lawyers. And it's a difficult job that lawyers are doing. They're trying to take what seems like fairly simple rules, but apply it to very complex cases, especially edge cases. And that becomes really complicated. Uh, so I started creating these little FAQs for myself. and I'll. Uh, I think they're pretty useful. Uh, so one fundamental thing I try to tell people is, you can only license the rights that you have. You cannot license the rights that you don't have. Actually, initially, honestly, I didn't even know the meaning of the word license. So does everyone here know the meaning of the word license? There's no need to be shy. <laughs> Oh, these people are really shy. It's not the Irish trade at all. Um, I mean, license means to give permission. Uh, I actually did not know that, uh, that exactly giving permission for stuff to someone to do something. So you can only license the rights you have, uh, which means you know things that you create, you have rights in them that you can, you can license. So that's one fundamental thing that took a long time to sink in my head. Uh, which is why you can't license something that's in the public domain. You don't have any rights in it. You have no rights to license in it. You can't license, I can't license Darius's work. I don't have any rights. He has the rights in it. Uh, if you don't apply a license, you license nothing, meaning you retain all the rights, which is really what a copyright license or all rights reserved is. So if you don't apply a license, by default you're saying that other than what is permitted by copyright law, which is fair use or fair dealing, you have no rights in it. I retain all the rights. Which is why it's very important to apply a license. But remember, you can only apply a license to the rights you have. A license is not a contract. Now, this is something that I still have, I still struggle with it. And people argue against it. A lot of people say that a license is nothing but a contract, just another word for a contract. A lot of people think that, say that it's not. I s fall toward the side where I believe that a license is not a contract, though it can sometimes act like a contract. Uh, one analogy I used, I was giving a talk at Google, and I said, think of, think of it this way. A license is a, is a unilateral permission given, given in advance to people you don't know. Or a contract you require two parties. Think of it this way. James Bond has a license to kill, but he's not a contract killer. <laughs> so he can kill for under certain conditions, right? But he, he, you know, they actually found this analogy to be very useful to understand that he is a license killer, but he's not a contract killer. Um, Creative Commons licenses 
may seem like a contract under certain conditions, but they don't act like a contract because the remedies of a contract don't apply uh, in Creative Commons licenses. On the other hand, a license like ODBL, the Open Database License uh, that was developed in the UK, uh, acts like a contract and can create issues. A license is not a magic shield where if you apply a license, suddenly your work acquires some magical powers allowing it to not be used or, or something to happen. No, I mean, it's just a, it's just a signal. It's just a, it's just a sign that tells people what they can or cannot do with your work. Uh, one of the criticisms that people come up with about Creative Commons licenses Oh, you're giving away these permissions, and now your work can be used by bad people. Yeah, but I mean, your work could be used by bad people even if it didn't have a Creative Commons license. You know, the license itself doesn't stop anyone from doing anything they want to do. Maybe it gives you recourse after the fact to do something to go after them or or, or ask them to terminate uh, to stop using your work. So what I say is that a license is a signal to the good people. It's a guide to the people who are unsure about how to use your work, and it's meaningless to the bad people. So stop worrying about the bad people, because there's nothing you can do to stop them from what they want to do. <clears throat> but worry about the good people and give them the means to proceed correctly with, with your work and, and do whatever they want to do. Uh, if somebody doesn't use your work the way you want it to, or doesn't give you credit, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna sue them? I mean, how many people in this world have the ability to sue people? It's just, certainly no academic or scientist will ever sue anyone. They just don't have the time or the resources or the money to do that. Uh, at the most, you can publicly shame them. You can, that's actually one of the best recourses you have is to publicly shame them. Um, um, and, uh, and that works. Um, but the idea is with the license to tell people that this is what you can do and hope that the good people will follow, follow your, your wishes. Most open licenses probably do what you want. People try to use, so we have, a, as I said, we have a variety of licenses stretching from very liberal licenses, CC BY, all the way to very restrictive licenses, CC BY and CND, uh, which doesn't allow any commercial use as well as doesn't allow any derivatives. Uh, I try to tell people to, to veer toward as open as possible because what you think the closed licenses do, they probably don't do that while open licenses will probably do everything you intend. Uh, one example is, for example, the NC license. Uh, a lot of people think that, you know, I, I want to put NC on my work because I don't want other people to benefit commercially from my work. Uh, true, but there is a side effect of NC licenses. Uh, for example, you cannot mix NC license work with essay licensed work. So, if I, for example, make a make something, in, uh, I don't know, an educational lesson or uh, or a music video, well, a story or a play, uh, and somebody wants to uh, maybe say put it on Wikipedia, they can't do that, or mix it with something on Wikipedia, they can't do that because Wikipedia is under SA. My work is under NC. NC says you can't use it for commercial purposes. SA says you can do anything you want to as long as you license under SA. What we have is what we in computer science call a no op. Right? Things just don't mix together. <clears throat> so you can actually achieve things by being more open than by being more closed. <clears throat> if you use most times licensing something is, is fairly easy. You make a song, uh, you license it under whatever license you want, a song. Most people realize that a song is, is something complete uh, and they know that the license applies to the song. But in science particularly, things are much more complex. Uh, they are a mix of many different sources. Marking them clearly is very, very important. 
Here's a little uh, example I made. Uh, this is a paper in a in a journal. Let's let's say. Uh, um, you go to the website and you're looking at the paper, uh, and the paper is under a CC BY license. Maybe it's under maybe it's on Public Library of Science. It's under a CC BY license. But in the paper itself, there's a bunch of stuff that's been used that's from different sources. Maybe there's a chart from Wikipedia under a CC BY SA. There's a photograph that's all rights reserved. There's another photograph which is under a by NC license. There's some data embedded inside the paper that's under CC0. Now imagine that you haven't marked all of these things separately. A user comes, looks at the paper, and says, oh, it's CC BY. But it's misled because it's only the contribution of the author that was under CC BY. Other things were still licensed under their separate licenses. So this kind of downstream use is really dependent upon marking things very correctly, uh, which is very, very important in science where things are always building upon other things. Um, so <clears throat> this is one of the big struggles that I have trying to, to explain to people. And it is, it, is, it is a burden. I mean, nobody really wants to, uh, to be faced with having to mark things correctly. Uh, uh, it would be a lot easier if everything were under a single license. We're not there yet, uh, but until then, we have to keep this in mind. I think, yeah, that's all the slides I have. I want to talk about my science work now, but I'll pause here at this point and ask a few people any questions. Yeah. I want right away about that slide. I was under the impression that embedding like that would count as derivation. And therefore, if something was non-commercial, for example, or had share-alike, like by SA, that the derivative work, that is the whole paper, would also have to be by SA. So is it actually possible in this case? You know, there's a graph there, which is by SA, but the whole yeah. paper is just by. Yeah, it's very possible. Uh, as we were talking earlier, one of the most difficult things, there's another thing I should put in my frequently asked questions. I, I always badger my legal colleagues. How do I determine that something is a derivative, something in an adaptation. Uh, and the answer is that you really can't. There's no formula. There's no formula which says that if you do so many steps on something, it becomes a derivative. Uh, <clears throat> there is no, I believe the term of art is bright line, mm -hmm. where something changes from you know being just. In this case, it's not a derivative because I haven't changed the chart in any way. So think of the chart itself. That <clears throat> has not been changed, or something new hasn't been created from it that has been adapted. So it is still used and published under its own license of CC by SA. It has not influenced or affected the rest of the works at all. And it continues to be offered under the same license. Uh, think of it as. It's in close proximity, but not inherently modified and changed. Sorry not to be asking yeah. the difficult questions, but um, in that case, one of the big issues with CC that I encountered, not personally, but you know, came across that people had this problem, was with podcasting and pod-safe music. So in podcasting, you would have music that might be under uh, no derivatives or non-commercial license, but the podcast itself may accept donations, so they didn't. They would want to avoid non-commercial or yeah. as an embedded work. So there was this tension that I mean, the music itself is is in an enclosed block. So you might say I could lift that out of the podcast without having to change it. Therefore, it's unchanged. It's in its original context as part of a broader work, but it's not regarded as pod safe. So I mean, is that a misconception? No, I mean NC does create a problem like that. So like for example, if this were if this paper were in a profit-making journal, mm -hmm. then probably utilizing NC would not be correct. I put it in there as an example, but I would probably not use that. But this uh, is a scientific paper, of course, he's not selling it. Yeah, that's well, it depends on the journal. Yeah, and that's the other issue. You know, I mean, who decides all of these things? Uh, but it is perfectly possible to mix things that are under different lineages of licenses. One example that I had recently was the California Academy of Sciences. They make educational videos 
uh, that they want to put out under CC license. They do put out under CC licenses. In one of the videos, they had a, it was like a three-minute-long video, and they had 52 seconds of underwater footage of whales that they had bought from a commercial source, and they had embedded that in there. It was a Apparently, it was a very crucial footage for that video. Uh, it's a very, the clear answer is that all you can do is you can say somewhere in the credits or somewhere that that 52 seconds starting from this time marker to this time marker is all rights reserved, so you cannot use that. But everything else is free game. It's under a CC license. Uh, of course, to a downstream user, it's difficult to, to figure that out. You know, in some in this kind of a case, it's actually pretty easy to figure out what is what. But in a video, it's 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 very difficult. In a music thing, where you let's say you layer two different soundtracks together, is it really possible to say that one is still independent of the other? In a computer software, it might look independent, but to a listener, it doesn't sound independent. I don't know the answers to that. I think lawyers can tell the answers, or you can go fight about it in the court. The easiest way is to try not to mix those things together. You know, I mean, the more. There's just one, one question that occurs to me looking at that, and it's particularly in the context of scientific um, information being you can present in any number of ways, obviously. And in the case of where you have a, a particular representation of scientific results, um, that might be you know, uh, made available. The graphic image of that representation could be made available under various degrees of openness. But the interpretation is really the critical thing, and um, uh, by affording people an opportunity to access the visual representation independent of the actual scientifically expert interpretation by the person that designed and executed the experimentation, that opens up uh, an opportunity for them to go their separate ways and for dubious interpretations and uh, um, less than credible opinions to be assigned to that particularly credible piece of work. Uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, you're saying that, that somebody could misinterpret my the very meaning of my work. Yeah, let me take that graph there. If something's yeah, yeah. up and something's staying relatively up. Yeah. You know, and within certain, you know, I could I could lift that out of a of a paper, and I could say, well, you know, I'm of a, a different view to the, the yeah, sure. Paper, I mean, and, and I interpret this to mean the following. Yeah, but I mean, that has got nothing that's completely orthogonal to the underlying license that's used. That can be done with with all rights reserved. It could be done with any kind of license. Uh, one of the one of the criticisms that is utilized that is used against Creative Commons licenses a lot is that by permitting others to reuse your work, for example, you're letting them make translations. Mm -hmm. And when they make translations mm -hmm. of your work, you have no control over it. So they could be making shoddy translations. Mm -hmm. But that is not inherently a property of the license itself. Mm -hmm. That is something that they could do anyway. If somebody wants to take something out of context, uh, again, as I said, you know, bad people will do bad things. There's not much you can do to prevent that. I'm asking you simply just test this, testing the logic of using this model from the point of view of a scientific and um, preservation of scientific integrity. Uh, I would say that preservation of scientific integrity is more a function of other tested mechanisms like peer review mm. uh, than the licensing structure itself. I mean, a license only. Uh, Underscores the legal status, not the intellectual status of the work. You, know, yeah. you could have, you could have, you could have a perfectly legal work that is intellectually bogus, right, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. there is you were trying to, were you raising a hand about something, and you were going to answer something or have no, a response to no, it. I'm okay. Surprised. Yeah. So they are just completely <coughs> different issues altogether. Uh, uh, people tend to. Again, as I said, you know, translation is one of the, particularly in digital humanities, this argument is, comes up over and over again. Mm -hmm. If I license my work under a CC BY license, then somebody will take my work and translate it into some other language and completely misrepresent what I'm saying. Yeah, but they could do that with all rights as a work also. So integrity of the work is really a completely different thing. Uh, Carl and I were talking about earlier about open hardware, and I was mm -hmm. talking about the issue of data certification. Data certification has got nothing to do with 
licensing, but it is a means of uh, uh, figuring out whether 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 that can be used to certify the quality of data that are coming out of hardware, for example. Uh, so it's sort of like that. The, the intellectual value of the research that I'm proposing, or, or the findings that I'm that I'm putting forward in my article, are a function of the integrity of the journal and the quality of the peer review, not the underlying license of the fact that I utilized sources. You know, um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. it does. It certainly helps qualify. Um, I've got uh, just 17 minutes. I want to uh, talk a little bit about what I do at Creative Commons. Um, uh, so I had the science program at Creative Commons. <coughs> We've sort of rebooted the science program a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, part of my work is this outreach, telling people about, uh, about Creative Commons and its licenses, encouraging them to use them. Uh, that's what I'll be doing in Dublin uh, at the Research Data Alliance meeting. Uh, but there are other exciting things that we want to try out as well and do. And I'll, I'll tell you a few of those things. Um, <clears throat> one of the areas that uh, I want to focus on this year quite a bit is the area of text and data mining. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, text and data mining or TDM uh, is a very, um, uh, it's increasingly popular uh, because uh, of the computing power that's available now, uh, but it's very, it's, its legal status is very hazy. Uh, in, in most countries, there is actually no treatment of it at all. In the United States, it's generally considered fair use, uh, but there's not enough case law to really determine its legal status. Um, and uh, there are a few ideas I have in mind about it. One is I want to hold a series of workshops around the world, uh, introducing people to uh, both the legal implications of the licenses they use on their work. I want to basically communicate that, look, you as a creator are also a user. So if you use open licenses, then you, the user, at some point will be using other people's work that's openly licensed, and that will make it easy for you to do things like text and data mining. Uh, but that's only half the story. Uh, just having openly licensed work is not enough for text and data mining. Uh, text and data mining can still be stopped dead in the tracks by contractual restrictions between publishers. Uh, so I've got a couple of crazy ideas about that um, that I want to try out. I don't know whether they'll fly or not. One is to try and uh, see the feasibility of developing some kind of boilerplate contractual language that people that universities can utilize to negotiate terms with publishers. Um, another one is to create an archive of pre-processed data so that you actually don't ever have to hit the, the published articles. You can actually just hit the pre-processed corpus. Um, um, and in these workshops, I would basically both introduce the tools and techniques of text and data mining as well as the legal implications of text and data mining. Uh, another area that I am uh, very uh, interested in and that I'm starting work in is in open hardware licensing. Uh, Creative Commons has restricted itself to copyright only, uh, but I believe open hardware is lies squarely in the middle of, of the information production life cycle. You know, it both consumes information and produces information. So if the hardware ecosystem is enriched and, and vital, then the consequent information commons will also be vital. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the licensing uh, regime around open hardware is very, it's not as mature as in the non-hardware side. And then there's the issue that hardware produces data. Uh, what about the quality of data that are produced from something that might be, you know, it might have an open license on it, and people might think that it's producing good data, but it's really not producing good data. So maybe just the license is not enough, but some kind of data certification is also required, particularly when data might be important for public health or climate change or some scientific thing, uh, where integrity of data is very important. Um, I uh, One issue that we are trying to grapple with is uh, the sort of the tension between privacy and openness. Uh, so <clears throat> generally, uh, you know, you have to inform the 
especially when humans have been involved, uh, any kind of human source of data is involved, you have to inform the human about, give, give the informed consent a bit, you know. Uh, a lot of people, uh, at least in the States, are thinking about, instead of focusing on how important it is to, uh, uh, to protect privacy, uh, what if we communicate to the to the people who are giving us the data the potential of potential benefits from openness? Uh, we still communicate to them the the issues about privacy, and we tell them that uh, we will do our best to protect the privacy, protect your privacy. But if you allow us to share this data, then all this good can happen. Uh, then if they give their consent, then we are free to use the data. Then that will allow us to bypass all the onerous privacy regulations that otherwise restrict the, the sharing of data. So uh, I'm working with some, actually right now primarily with geneticists, uh, but I would love to see this uh, uh, be adopted by private manufacturers of devices as well. I'm particularly interested in uh, sensors like this that uh, individuals use as a Fitbit, uh, but there are lots of them like this uh, now popping up every week in, in the Bay Area at least. Um, uh, but all of this data, like for example, any data that I generate from this goes into Fitbit's computers and it's going in siloed inside there. Uh, if I have four different sensors, I can't even see them together in one place. You know, I, I put my nutritional information in one place, I put my pedometer information in one place, I put my uh, maybe heartbeat, uh, heart, uh, blood pressure data somewhere else, and I can't see a consolidated chart of these. Even better would be if 20 million other users like me, all the data that we were contributing could be put in a big pool and used for public good, using personal data for public good. Uh, that's a bigger challenge to solve, primarily because this is being driven by private entrepreneurs and they need to figure out their own revenue streams. Uh, but maybe the notions of privacy versus sharing debate might help there, uh, you know, allowing them to pull the data into some kind of archive. Uh, and the fourth <coughs> initiative that I'm actually very excited about is, uh, is analogous to our CC affiliates. Um, I want to establish a network of scientists uh, who would be CC science affiliates. Uh, uh, historically, <coughs> most of our affiliates have been either in the creative fields or lawyers. Uh, so scientists are very, very absent from the CC affiliate network, almost completely absent, uh, which creates a major problem. It creates a problem both ways. Creative Commons is unable to really understand fully the needs of the scientists both jurisdictionally as well as discipline-wise, uh, and, uh, and our reach is limited to, to you know, only the people who are part of the CC network. Uh, so by creating a, a network of um, scientists who are uh, CC science affiliates, <coughs> we hope to reach a much more broader audience and create this sort of two-way dialogue between CC and the rest of the globe in the science area. Just in that respect particularly, um, and I know it's early stages yet, but do you, do you envisage that funding, public funding bodies being an obstacle to scientists embracing this and given the expectation of an economic return on their scientific endeavors and that it would translate? Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, I would assume that that would be more jurisdiction dependent. Uh, Some funders are moving, like in Horizon 2020, they're piloting open research data. So, you know, like they're going to pilot that some mm -hmm. scientists will have to, or that they will make their yeah. data open access. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they do say if it's, you know, impinges on the, uh, the innovation of patent possibility and all that, mm -hmm. there's no requirement there. But they are taking steps towards it. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely no requirement in the United States at all. Now, I actually, so to be clear, uh, the Science Affiliates Network, I particularly want to uh, reach out to what's generally called the Global South. Uh, uh, open science and open data conversation is, uh, <clears throat> is thriving a lot, but it's thriving mainly in the developed countries, mainly in, like if you go to uh, Open Knowledge Festival, for example, uh, basically all you'll see is the US, 
Europe, UK, New Zealand, Australia. Where are the Africans and the Asians and the South Americans? And that's really a, a major uh, drawback to uh, I mean, I think lacking in open science and open data. So I want to reach out. Uh, now, I guess my notion is maybe naive that if scientists, uh, especially prominent ones, maybe they're already advocates of open, uh, or, or if they become advocates of open, they will help change the system. I don't know if the, if the funding bodies of their countries require them to act a certain way, but maybe as they will be able to change that. That's part of the problem. We don't know. Can anyone here say how science is funded in Brazil or China or Malawi? Do you even know where Malawi is? Most people don't, right? So, but there are countries. I mean, you know, there's a Cuban Science Academy. I actually met someone. I, I was like amazed. Wow, Cuba has a science academy. Uh, we didn't know that. Uh, so to embrace them and bring them into the conversations, really understand. Uh, like for example, I know that the United States federal government doesn't allow uh, holding copyright in anything that its employees create. But I don't know about any other country. There's no there's no database about it. There's no knowledge base about it. I don't know how science is funded in other countries. So this will be a small attempt to try and cure that, uh, to try and get the scientists in the conversation to learn really what they're doing. Uh, it's a it's a big world out there, you know. The, the developing world is, I don't know, five six billion people, uh, and there are a lot of scientists there. So uh, this will be one way to reach out to them. Any other questions? 